All right, so today I want to walk through this case study about dysautonomia and gastroparesis. So for any of you that are dealing with digestive problems, but also having problems with dysautonomia POTS, orthostatic hypotension, these types of neurological syndromes, I hope this is going to be useful for you. My name is Dr. Nathan Kaiser. These are the kind of cases I see, and I'm hoping that by passing them along, I may give you a different way to look at it, maybe give you a, a solution that helps you get through your problems. So here goes. So this person was... <clears throat> she was a 21-year-old female, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through her symptoms. I'm going to walk through kind of the journey that got her to this point, things she's done before, things she's experienced before. We're going to talk about the things she's done up to this point to try to get better, things that have been prescribed, things she's done. And then from there, I want to look at what did we see when we look for the underlying problems. So differentiating what the symptoms are versus where things aren't functioning well. And hopefully that'll be useful for, for this conversation. And then we'll talk about the solutions that we came up with that ultimately led to a positive outcome. So um, let's get after it. Hope it works for you. So first symptoms, when she presented, she was experiencing a high level of fatigue. She's 21 years old. She's starting her work career. Very, very tired. Um, and she had a pain that she described as a brick in the lower part of her stomach. And then she was sensitive all over her abdomen. Um, she was dizzy. Her dizzy she described as lightheadedness, unsteadiness, not really spinning so much. She was nauseous most of the time, especially worse in the morning. And she had had um, a few years prior to that, she had been diagnosed, she had a excuse me, she had a pain in her chest, went and got her heart checked out, and they found uh, this rare kind of rhythmic problem that's called Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. It can be very dangerous. She was able to have an ablation and resolve it. But I want to share that part because it's really important for what we're going to talk about with the coordination of her gut. Um, and she also had had a facility toward vomiting since she was very young, since birth. Most days she's dizzy. She wakes up sick in the morning. Um, and that's kind of like the current status of where she's at when she came um, to the clinic. Previously, so we do the math here. So two years prior to that exam, she had been to a specialty um, dysautonomia clinic here in the Midwest. And they did a super great in-depth workup. Um, she, at that point, was diagnosed with dysautonomia, but she had been experiencing dizziness, GI pain. Um, achy legs, headaches, you know, the same sorts of things. She did a QSART test, which was negative, looking at peripheral nerve components. Um, she was symptomatic on a tilt test, but it was an equivocal tilt test, meaning her heart rate didn't really jump high enough to be considered POTS. But it wasn't as though she did a tilt test and felt great. So she's in that gray space where she doesn't meet the clinical criteria for POTS based on heart rate change but she was symptomatic upon orthostasis. They did a Wingate test, which is an exertion test, and found that uh, at seven minutes after, she started to get a drop in the blood pressure. Okay, so once we started to see the blood pressure drop, now we kind of have to expand our view and say, okay, normally when we look at a tilt test, the heart rate becomes our main mechanism to compensate for any changes in blood flow. And then here, we're actually picking up that post Wingate test, she actually started to have that drop in blood supply or, or blood pressure. Um, they did an upper GI scope, which was negative at that time. And that was kind of how it was left. She was given some, some medication to be able to try to uh, manage the symptoms. And then about, so that was in the summer and then the fall of the next year, uh, she began to have a different kind of abdominal pain uh, went in, was, was evaluated for endometriosis and was diagnosed with endometriosis and then was uh, treated with Lupron, which is a, an estrogen antagonist. Um, and she did have, she did feel better um, with that as far as the abdominal pain goes, um, some different changes relative to mood um, that came with that. She had an endoscopy at that time and a colonoscopy both of which were negative. So she had, um, she also had a gastric emptying test that looks at the speed of transit of food 
going through the digestive tract. So we can try to figure out where along the way is this slowing happening. And she was diagnosed with mild gastroparesis because they noticed a little bit of slowing in the third hour, which is a really tough diagnosis. It's kind of in the, in the, like in the very mild range. But what this gets to is the conversation that you start to think about around gastroparesis, which means a slowing of digestion. So it could mean that we have um, problems with digestive mostly in the stomach where we have problems with accommodation or moving it through the fundus or being able to pass it through uh, into the small intestine. It gets complicated when you think about it that way, um, but it's necessary to know those things. A way to think about it in this conversation might be just to think about it takes the same way it takes coordination to speak or to walk or to look around the room, to play a sport, to be able to do most things that we do, take a, a measure of coordination, which means we have to um, map out in the future the way that we're going to move multiple systems at the same time. So if we take that same idea and we map it on to thinking about digestion, you realize <clears throat> digestion is this kind of long coordinated event and it's coordinated in terms of muscularity relative to getting the food down into the stomach. It's coordinated in terms of how the stomach is able to create a churning or a grinding apparatus that allows us to make food small enough to move it into the next stage of digestion and then to then move it through all the, the future stages of digestion until we have excretion. But it also means that we have to coordinate responses of enzyme release, digestive acid release, being able to make sure all of these things are occurring at the right time so that we don't get uh, a backup in the system or we don't get changes in um, the pH of the chyme or the food that comes through. So if you, make, if you zoom out and you make it bigger, what we want to think about is the coordination of digestion. How effective is the coordination of digestion? Here we can see that um, there's an amount of inefficiency that happens here that prevents her from being able to adequately digest at that time. So she had a really nice workup. They checked to make sure she didn't have any acute um, GI infections, no H. pylori, no gastritis, nothing that would be from something that was currently causing uh, an infective response in her gut, didn't have SIBO, none of these things, which is really helpful to look at. Um, so that kind of brings us up to now. And then we would look at for the current regimen of things she's on based on these workups. And the whole regimen is applied biochemistry. So there's a ton of medication involved. Um, anytime you look at the medication, you have to look at, is it meant for an acute injury? Is it meant for a prolonged or chronic type of an event? How do they mix? How do all these things relate together? So um, you'll see it's a pretty, pretty big list. So she's on Bentil for IBS. Reglan for gastroparesis, uh, Depo-Provera for endometriosis, also Lupron for endometriosis. So these are some heavy hitters. Um, Singular for allergies, Concerta to focus, to be able to pay attention at work, Bispirone for anxiety, Trintelix for depression, and this is a major depression treatment. Um, she tried a gluten-free diet without any any marked success. Um, she noticed that marijuana helped with pain and appetite. And um, the only exercise she really does is walking around um, as part of her, her daily work environment. So that kind of brings us to where we're at in the beginning of um, our exam in the history that went through that. So you can see she's had some really contemporary work up at that point. Um, They've done a good job coming down to that. Treatment tools were mostly through bio, biomedical interventions um, using biochemistry and, and medication. So we wanted to take a look at that and understand, especially when you look at discoordination within the gut and then kind of how that manifests alongside a similar kind of discoordination relative to being able to have orthostasis, to be able to stand up without having um, autonomic hyperactivity or hypoactivity to be able to compensate for just something simple like standing up. So in other words, you don't want to have your body to have to work super hard to do something simple like 
stand on two feet. If that's the case, then we know that something um, is out of line or not, or not working correctly, and that's why we see these types of symptoms develop. So I'm going to walk through kind of what we found. Um, easiest place to start is probably looking at vitals. So did a tilt exam with her, uh, and we noticed that the blood pressure was stable throughout, so no drop. A lot of times what we're looking for, um, so if we take a diastolic number and a systolic number, right? So the, the systolic number is the top number when we think about blood pressure, 120 over 80. So systolic would be the top number. And it's usually higher pressure. Systole is, is the portion of kind of the heart cycle where we have contraction. And when you contract the heart, you're going to push more blood into the system, which is going to increase the blood pressure because you're pushing it through a tube through an artery. So as you increase that blood pressure, that's the top number. The bottom number is what happens when the heart relaxes. So when you relax, that wave kind of slows down and there's less pressure against the arterial wall. That diastolic number is actually super important when we look at a tilt because it can tell us what the integrity is of, of the system being able to put contraction into the peripheral arterial system. So if, if we have someone, for example, that had a peripheral neuropathy where the nerves that go to all the peripheral arteries weren't working as well, then it can't create that tension when someone stands up and the diastolic number may drop. It's really helpful. But if we do have the ability to send a signal from our brain to the arteries themselves to constrict, what will happen when someone is, is standing or tilted is you'll see a... a an increase in that diastolic number because there has to be a, a higher level of general tension on the artery to be able to maintain the blood flow even when you're between heartbeats. So even between heartbeats, there has to be more tension on the vessel, which will increase the diastolic blood pressure. So we're usually looking for that to make sure that we have it there. She had a little bit of a, of a bump in that, so we were able a little bit of a rise in the diastolic pressure. So that combined with looking at peripheral nerves, um, peripheral, peripheral neuropathic testing can help us understand if we're actually getting signals that are going into the arterial tree. So blood pressure was relatively stable. She did have um, a 30 degree, or excuse me, a 30 point change in her heart rate. So she went from an average of 69 laying down to 99 on the tilt, so right at 30. Um, so you can do with that what you will. So she def she qualifies for what would be considered a POTS diagnosis. She was symptomatic when she stood up, started feeling lightheaded. Um, <clears throat> and that's really helpful. It doesn't tell us a ton about what's going on inside the brain at that moment, but it helps us know that our, our heart, your heart rate has to compensate for doing something simple like standing up. Um, so we know there's, a, there's a, an error in that system. She had acrocyanosis when she, when she was tilted or stood up. So she began to have pooling in her legs. There's some um, purpling that comes into the skin as that, that uh, the venous insufficiency sets in. So she had that and she felt very lightheaded. One thing that was really important for her was that she had a loss of sensation to both pinwheel and vibration on the left side of her body. If you've looked at any of my videos before, we talked about this in another case um, that you might enjoy looking at. But it's very interesting to see that we would have these types of sensory changes only on one side of the body. <clears throat> Normally, if we think of systemic problems, um, things like autoimmunity, things like metabolic disease, these are things that tend to happen bilaterally. And they tend to happen peripherally first, like toward the toes and fingers first, and then they tend to come upward. So here we're actually seeing in both the, the upper body and the lower body, where we're having just on the left side, sensory changes in multiple different fiber types. Meaning, so when we look at vibration as one example, so the ability to detect vibration is done through large diameter afferents, or what that would mean is like big, thick, myelinated sensory nerves. So that would be contrasted with when we look at like a pinwheel or a pin prick or a temperature sensation. 
In those cases, these are different types of nerves. These are C fibers. They are small diameter, so they're really thin, and they don't have myelin on them. For it to be a mixed neuropathy that just affected one side that was upper and lower would be odd. So the thing that we would probably look at more intently is actually looking at what's going on in the controllers on the right side of the brain to be able to understand what's going on there better. Okay, so that's really helpful in this type of a case. So we're looking at that coordinated element. So if we've got a loss of sensation on one side of the body, on the left side of the body, we want to know, does that affect the way that this person operates? And one of the ways that we understand that best is to look at coordination. So we take sensory information in that helps us understand where we are. And that helps us to be able to then move in an accurate way to how our body is situated in the world, yeah? So if I can't feel my feet, the likelihood that I will be able to place them correctly when I walk goes down. So I might have to change the way I walk or my balance might get worse in order to compensate for that. So if we got a change in the sensation on one side of the body, some of the time we will see changes in the way people balance because they're getting a different amount of information from one side compared to the other. So in this case, what we do is we put people on a foam pad. <clears throat> and we measure their balance. Ideally, people should be able to stand on that foam pad for 20 seconds and be able to close their eyes and be able to turn their head and not have any problems and be able to stand there pretty still. In this case, what we saw <clears throat> was that when she turned her head to the left and then when she flexed her head down and then when she tipped her head back with her eyes closed for each, that she actually fell and wasn't able to sustain her balance. So this is an indicator for us that perhaps the way that this system is processing this information is not adequate to be able to coordinate something simple like static or dynamic posture where we're just kind of standing in place, trying to be still taking your eyes out of the equation. Okay, so we know that there's some discoordination in that postural component. I'm moving because my leg's going to get numb. Um, okay, so then what we might, then what we want to do is we know that if we take, <clears throat> if we move vision out of the system, things get a little bit worse. So one of the things that helps us in localization is to actually look at the way the eyes move in space. If I'm looking to the left, it requires different machinery in my brain than if I'm looking to the right, okay? If I am following a target, it's different machinery than if I jump to a target. And then the same thing applies if we start to change the level and look up and down, or we start to look on diagonals. All of these things tell us they come from slightly different output nuclei in the brainstem, and they will use different machinery within the different hemispheres of the brain to be able to coordinate those events. So what we wanna look at is, is there an overlay? Is there, is there a way that it makes sense that we would look at how the eyes are functioning that also are incorporated with what we see on the left side of the body with that change in, um, in sensation, the change in coordination? Or can we try to prove that maybe that's not it and try to see if there's something else here that's causing this problem? So what we found, um, just simple things like, can you look in one spot and be able to hold your eyes? So the same way we're trying to stand still, can you stand still and be there on purpose and not fall over? Also, can you just like look at a target and keep your eyes on it without them moving around, without them losing their balance, so to speak. And what we found was when she looks to the left, the, her gaze, her ability to hold the target was unstable. And we measured that with video oculography, where you can look at the eyes on, a, on, a, on film and be able to see them jerking while she's trying to hold her eyes steady. So it tells us there's some instability in being able to, to maintain that movement to the left. At the same time, when we looked at uh, her ability to track objects, or what we call a pursuit. When she tracked to in the rightward direction, she had square wave jerks, which means as she was following the target, her eyes would jerk away from the target. And that's really helpful for us to understand that. Uh, if we think about it just on a very simple basis, when we pursue from left to right, we use um, the pursuit eye fields. So we use these parietal eye fields on the right side of the brain to be able to stabilize that movement. And we coordinate that with areas in the cerebellum and areas in the brainstem to be able to make that movement accurate. 
we know that if we've got a loss of sensation on the left side, we're also looking at a potential for changes in sensory inputs to that right side of the parietal lobe. So we see these things kind of start to overlap in, in these cases, uh, which is really helpful. And then if we take that and make it a little bit more complex, looking at the eyes, we can look at reflexes that are called optokinetic reflexes. And these occur when we have peripheral or, or like peripheral field of vision, like you're watching a train go by or you're in a crowded space. And it's this generalized movement that occurs, whether you are moving, like you're sitting on a train and watching things go by, or if you're sitting still and watching a train go by. In both cases, the world is kind of moving around you. We have reflexes that develop from the time we're about a year old that allow us to track within a range of motion so our eyes will follow it and then they will snap back to the middle to the neutral position and then follow again and snap back to the middle and follow again and we call this nystagmus optokinetic nystagmus and it's really useful for us to understand how well you're able to take in sensory information about movement and be able to coordinate that back into movements with the eyes so in other words if something is passing by you at a certain speed, we would expect that your eyes should maintain that same speed throughout the time you're watching it. So in this case, we're watching something that's on a screen travel by, and we expect that your eyes should have a pretty symmetrical pattern to how they watch that. When she did her optokinetic responses, they are variable, which means that sometimes they work at the right speed, Sometimes they're a little bit slow or they have elongated slow phases and sometimes they're a little bit quick where they're too fast for the movement and the range gets too small. These are again something that help us understand that, that measure of coordination. So if we, if we kind of pull that back, we're seeing elements of oculomotor control, elements of postural control, elements of um, cardiovascular control, elements of gastrointestinal control that are discoordinated in this case. And I know that's not, I know that sounds kind of crazy a little bit probably to think about that because it's not the way that most people are, are, are thinking about this. But if you think about it as a discoordination, then we, we can think about it as, well, what could we do that would allow us to generate coordination in a better way or to do it again at all? Um, and that's kind of what we're thinking about in this case. It's also worth noting that with the postural component and with the ocular motor component, we also then want to look at the ability to coordinate eye movement with head movement. Not something that we usually think about, actually something that we usually take for granted in a pretty major way. But if we're doing something like someone says our name over here and we say, hey, our ability to be able to turn our head and our eyes at the same time or to coordinate the movement of our head and eyes is like a very foundational component to the way we operate. So if we know our balance isn't good and we know there are errors in the oculomotor system relative to a particular part of the brain. We then want to look at, can you coordinate the two together? Can you put eye and head movements together? And for her, she had what we call a hypometric gain of eye and head movement, meaning as she would follow a target, she should, you should be able to keep your head and your eyes on a target as you move through space. In her case, she could keep her eyes on the target, but her head would lag behind. So there's a dissynergy in the way that the signals come to be able to coordinate the head movement to the eye movement. Again, another way that we can look at this, this coordination of the system. So when we looked at it that way, um, the model then becomes, well, we know that we can do things that can help improve coordination. The same way you can learn how to coordinate swinging a baseball bat better. You can learn how to swim better. You can learn how to play the piano better. All of these things are different elements of coordination. And our brain is really geared in a major way to be able to do that. Like our capacity for that is pretty high. So what we want to think about is taking those same strategies, but just applying them to way more foundational elements, which means the similar rules apply. Can we break them down into simpler approaches or, or simpler tasks that we can execute better? and then be able to combine them again into a more complex activity in a way that suits lifestyle. So that's the way we thought about it and we thought of training these things. So the exercise design in this case was to improve coordination of postural control systems, which comes from your, everything from your eyes to your feet, the ability to just control the way you move in space. 
in her case, because we've got this change in perception and capacity, the ability to feel the left side of her body, we know that if you can't get information in, it's really hard to then move. So if you can't feel it, it's hard to move it. So we focus there and we work on how do we get her to be able to feel that left side of her body, knowing that peripheral nerves are intact, but we're not feeling it so well when it comes to understanding it in the brain. So how can we change that electrical potential to be able to make it clearer? And if it's clearer, does that change the way that she can then operate other systems within her body? So the uh, kind of the effect that we took was we started using, I mean, we call, we call them neural rehabilitation strategies. So these are just, we would look at physical rehabilitation. If you blow out your knee or your elbow, we're working on gaining strength coordination capacity within a muscle group. We want to think about it less as within a muscle group and more as can we do it within a neural pathway? So similar model, but we're just going to change the structure of how we're thinking about it. So can we, can we create long-term potentiation? Can we create synaptogenesis and neuroplasticity? Can we create growth in a neurological pathway that has an outcome in the way that we operate in the world? So for her, we did a combination of um, peripheral sensory stimulus where we actually stimulated the peripheral nerves combined with movements of her limbs. So we actually chose to use two counterphase movements where in one case we know when we add like complexity of movement to a limb that it gets an increase in its output from the deep cerebellar nuclei. So it increases um, sensory affrontation relative to the movement, which is, is useful. It allows us to have a greater output to, to the contralateral portion of the brain. We also know the opposite of that. If we, if we have an isometric style of movement, it actually decreases the deep cerebellar nuclear output. So it changes, it actually lowers the amount of output uh, cortically. So we used mechanisms of left-sided activity and right-sided um, isometric contraction to change the overall drive to that portion of the brain. And we combine that with um, pursuit activities with both her eyes and with eye head types of pursuits. So we're trying to generate a higher coordination level by first taking them apart and then putting them back together. So can we learn how to do a retinal slip activity by using a head movement? Then can we transfer that? So if I'm looking at a target and I turn my head, creates that slow movement of my eyes to the right uh, if I turn my head to the left that mimics the error that she had in tracking an object to the right. So we can use the same retinal slip component to be able to modify a pursuit by using uh, a head turn in this place. So we start with that, we turn that into a pursuit, we turn that into then a coordinated eye head pursuit in a progression. And then we did um, activities to improve the sensation through her body. So by uh, increasing peripheral stimulus with the eye movement. When we did that, uh, we were able to measure changes in her posture, meaning she was able to stand on the pad, turn her head, and be able to stand tall, be able to stand without falling. We, she was able to improve the sensation to both vibration and pinwheel on the left side of the body. Importantly, both while laying down and while standing up. That part really matters, especially when we think about not being able to effectively deliver blood flow to the head, which is where we see the, the cardiac compensation. We saw that when that happened, the heart rate doesn't have to work as hard. So when we put her on a tilt, the elevation is only 15 points. Um, that makes sense for us because we know if we can feel our body better, then we're going to be able to supply blood better. Um, they run on a similar um, architecture in terms of how, to, how we have a motor system that sends blood versus creates movement. And we'll talk, we've talked about that in other videos. Um, if you need to kind of get a refresher on that, you can look through the channel. There's a whole, the whole bunch on that. Um, so anyway, so coming back to it, by understanding where her head is in space, by being able to feel her body again, now we can coordinate movement at a higher level. We didn't do anything that necessarily was specific to coordinating movement through the GI tract. We did mostly things that were coordinating, can we get the right sensor, sensory information in and does that yield an appropriate coordination of motor activity on the other side. So if I get the feels in, can I do the right movements afterwards? And what we saw in the effect of that was that even though we didn't do anything that was specific to the way she ate, 
the way that she was able to start transmitting food through the system changed. Her digestion changed, and she was able to digest on a more con consistent basis, uh, having regular bowel movements, no pain in the stomach, no feeling of stasis or like things were stuck, uh, and having normalization of that system. So when we followed up, um, after she did her homework for one month, she came in, was doing better, was able to decrease some medications, was, was at work, um, was feeling less pain in her gut. And then two months later, she reported she was able to start exercising. She was walking uh, after work, and then she was doing uh, like in the gym exercise as well. She didn't have any GI issues, no nausea or heart rate spikes. And she noted that her mood was improved and that she was able to do more in her social life, which if you're 21 years old, you know how, how big of a deal that is. So the moral of the story in this case was we had someone that had, had a, an accurate diagnosis of dysautonomia gastroparesis and wasn't able to fully get over the hump using just a purely biochemical strategy. So we had to think about it a little bit differently. And we had to say, we are noticing coordination problems as they're occurring in these other systems. We are noticing that the primary symptomatic complaints you have are relative to discoordination within pathways in the gut and within the cardiovascular system. If we can change the way that your body processes this information, if we can make that cleaner, and then we can have a measurable outcome on the other side, does that have an effect in the coordination of the system? In this case, it did, uh, and it's you know great success, and we're super proud of that. But what I'm hoping that it does is that in the moral of that, you can see that stopping to think about it a little bit different way, even though it seems a little bit crazy, might be a catalyst for thinking of a new way to solve your problem, especially if you're stuck. So if you're stuck, if you're working on it, if you're a doctor and you're having a hard time with a certain case, maybe shifting the way that you think about it um, and bringing in to, uh, like a different specialty might help in being able to solve the problem in a different way. So. Uh, I hope this video helps. If you like to leave a comment or just leave a note, I'm happy to read them and, uh, and hear about your stories and hear about um, how this may help you. So hope it helps. We'll talk soon. Thanks.